welcome back to Music Talk. I'm Dave. Mike. There it is. Yeah. And this week, we're doing the latest from Savoy Brown. Looks like this. It's called Blues All Around. Yep. This one just came out in February of this year, 2023. So we got that on the inside. We got a cool little picture of him jamming on his flying V. Got some writing and stuff in here. People that played on it. On the back, you got the three guys. The track yep. listing. Pretty nice. And then you got the album or CD. So this CD background is a painting done by Kim Simmons. Yeah, and he's actually got a lot of paintings. If you go on their site, he's got stuff on there. I don't know how you buy it or not. It's also in this as well. I don't know if you can buy them on there or what, but he, he's got a lot of paintings that he's done. So apparently he got into the art world, you know, doing art. But I've seen some of the stuff and he's got some really nice looking stuff, man, mm -hmm. as far as painting goes. So a yeah. uh, little bit about Savoy Brown. I didn't go digging too much. I was never a big Savoy Brown fan, even though I know that all the people that I like were inspired by them, you know, and a lot of people have been in and out of them. You know, it's one of those bands that people come in and then they go, you know, they mm -hmm. come and go. Yep. A lot yep. of people played for them. Um, it seems to me like they were one of the big movements of the English blues rock. You know, at the time, it was like, I mean, you had some others out there, but it seems like Savoy Brown was one of the ones that kind of spurred that movement. Yeah, they um, they were they were the ones that kicked it off, kind of kicked it off. Actually, I, I'm not I'm not saying they were the only ones over right. there, but they were the ones that kind of took it to the next level, which ushered in a lot of the. Uh, the newer rock and roll that we're listening to today, actually. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean, their first back, record came out in 67. Yeah. So, they, you know, they were playing around for a couple of years before that. Yeah, they had a band was put together in 65 and 67 yeah. put out their first album. Right. But they had, you know, they, 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 they don't list all their albums. I mean, there's so over 30 of them. And he had, I guess, like five solo albums that he did too. Right. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, there are a lot of names that went through the band. Uh, uh, yeah. The biggest one I think everybody recognizes would be Foghat. You know, I think we've talked about this before, actually. Yeah. You know, Lonesome Dave and, and Roger yeah. Earl and, um, and Tony know, Stevens. Yeah. Tony yeah. Stevens. Yeah, so they, yeah, left they were in 1970. Yeah, they were part. Yeah. yeah, they were part of Savoy Brown there at a the time. And the one little story that I read about that whole deal, and the reason why I'm bringing up all this history stuff is because it was Kim Simmons that put these this band together. Right. So Dave Previtt, he was called on. They were in the middle of doing an album. I forget what the name of the album was. I was trying to dig out that one album I got over here that had a had a, like a brief history on the back of it, but I couldn't find it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, Yaldon was the lead singer at the time, and Dave Previtt was nothing but another guitar player in the band and yeah. probably did a little bit of background vocal here and there. Well, Yaldon got sick during the time that they were recording. So Lonesome Dave, he got to sing, I think, two songs all together on the album. Yeah. And I really believe that that's what spurred the whole thing along with the fog uh, hat. to put Fog Hat together. I think some of it was maybe a little dissension. I don't know this for for sure. I mean, this is all supposition on my part, mm -hmm. but I think it was probably a little supposition there, you know, of, 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 of there being a little ill will because I'm sure Dave Previtt thought he should be out front singing, mm -hmm. which he very well should have. So, well, if you can't do it here, well, then I got to go over here and do it. So, and right. that's what he did. They right. picked up and left and hence, fog hat yep. uh, but, 
But I got to tell you, though, I mean, there were several versions of Savoy Brown I love. There, the Boogie Brothers, I love that album. Yeah. Street Corner Talking, I love that album. Right. Hellbound Trains, another one that just. There's a lot. There's a lot of good songs out there. I mean, I was watching some old stuff, old concerts and things, and there's some mm -hmm. really good stuff out there, you know. And they oh, seem yeah. like one of those bands that did a rotation, kind of like a, a blues breaker type deal, where you never knew who was coming. You right, know, John, John Mayall, Mayall right, yeah. and then a cast of members that would just come and go, and yeah. uh, and same with Savoy Brown. There was a couple guys that left, come back, left, come back, you know. So. I mean, even Bill Bruford played for him for three shows, and I don't know if he was exactly <laughs> fired or quit, but, you know, uh, Kim Simmons said he was fiddling around with the rhythm too much, so he didn't really, because <laughs> we know how Bruford is. It's probably he, a he mutual agreement. It, it probably was. Agreement. I mean, I can't, he can't play a straight eight-bar blues, man. I mean, he <laughs> just ain't going to do it. No, I mean, uh -uh. He it, it'll, he'll be back on there in about six or seven measures, but it ain't going to sound like a regular eight bar blues so and and when you listen to this record you can tell that kim simmons was failing in health really um uh, he actually passed away december 13th yep. 2022 mm -hmm. and yep. then this came out in february so the whole thing is that you know he went in and laid down all of his tracks the guitar organ harmonica vocals and then the drummer and bass player came in later and finish the record mm -hmm. and at times you can tell that it seems like they didn't quite finish a couple songs to me there are a few in there that are kind of incomplete maybe you know yeah well i felt like that what we were listening to on on some of the stuff were scratch tracks you know yeah. uh, like some of the uh just to so you could get the rhythm section down yeah and then come back in again and and polish up the the rough corners, but that mm -hmm. didn't happen. I don't think it happened. Uh, yep. The some of the lyrics to me were a little elementary, and I think it, that's something else too that they would have probably gone back over and cleaned up um, if they had time. Yeah, you know, but they just left it alone and. The reason why I've been saying, you know, when we were talking earlier, that he knew this was his last hurrah. There's one of the songs that even talks about how he uh, gets up in the morning and cleans his bloody nose. Yeah, that kind of caught me a little bit. I was like, yeah. man, that's kind of weird, man. Yeah. You know, I don't know that why I would put that in a song, but. But, I mean, I think it, that's why he put it in there because. And and the thing is, is and I'm a, we just need to go ahead and put it out there. He had a type of colon cancer. It was very rare. Mm -hmm. And they said that when the symptoms really start showing up for this kind of colon cancer, that it's stage four. Yeah. Right out yeah, the bat. There's not much you can do about it. Yeah. yeah it, it's just one of those that's sort of very rare. Yeah. yeah. So that's what he was dealing with was colon cancer. He right. found out August. They did the album in December. Well, well, he passed in December. Yeah. Well, he passed in December. So from August to December, they put this album together. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure that the, the rest of the guys went back in after he passed away and tried to do what they could, you know, and still maintain the integrity of what was happening. But Yeah. Well, we'll go through so, this real quick. I don't have a whole lot to say about every song. Um kind of typical blues record here mm -hmm. you know the first song was just a 43 second intro basically to the cd yeah. well i was it, kind of expecting it to sound like this you know i was hoping it would be more of the acoustic front well the reason i think i say that is because going into this record you had told me that it's going to sound like he's sitting on the front porch right and so, the the first so song this intro i was like mm -hmm. okay this is where we're mm -hmm. going like a muddy waters type thing yeah right but that's how they closed the album too it bookend right well they called the first one falling first through. One falling through and then right. the next one was falling through the cracks yeah at the end of it yeah and, yeah and um this, it so was this is kind song. of this kind of what i was expecting the whole cd to sound like i was hoping it would too i, yeah. I really i really did think it that's the way it was going when i first heard yeah that excerpt you know 
but then we get to number two and it's, it's called black heart and you know typical eight bar blues um good guitar work though right i mean yeah. he's playing the crap out of guitar yeah, it's a good hard blues song you know yeah, <clears throat> yeah. and they could have they could have dropped that wood block though that they were yeah. using i didn't like that you know i mean i thought that was a little bit off color considering it was a hard rock and blues tune i mean i was like what's the point yeah and you know and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute though so the third song was going down south and this is i think the song that had the bloody nose thing going but he does some slide in this and he mentioned in the 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 album cover that you know he was having problems moving playing his fingers to be able to you know playing with his fingers yep. to do single notes or yep. single strings so they suggested just doing some slide work and you'll hear there's two three maybe four songs where it's slide that you can mm -hmm. tell that he was you know he did that but he plays slide back in the day so i mean he's a great slide player so yeah i have yeah. no problem with any of the guitar work on here it's all good you know um then we get to number four which the next two songs to me were the best songs on the record gypsy healer yep number four but I had a problem with this, man, because and it drove me crazy, and I had to pick up the guitar and uh, learn it, right? Because mm -hmm. it was driving me nuts. <laughs> There's something the bass player was doing, and it didn't match what Kim was playing. So it's right. in the key of C, right? And then they uh -huh. do the turnaround and key of C and, and C. But then when they go to the the chorus, it's an E flat, right? So you're in E flat to F, and then he ended it the bass was going to a g and it just totally sounded off to me so i don't know what kim was playing on the guitar but the g that the bass was playing did not work when they were both playing together and this is one of the problems when you have pre-recorded tracks and then you come they, in later yeah. and try to play it right it's well, the uh, right or, note but it just doesn't fit you know what I mean? Were they using a keyboard player in that part? Do you remember? I don't think so. I think this was just a three piece with Kim singing. Yeah, because I know a lot of times bass players will shy away from what the left hand of a keyboard player is doing so they don't clash. Yeah. You know, so but this one, I think, I don't know. I feel like if he would have just went to the F, it would have made it right. Yeah. But he did the G and it just felt off to me. I mean, yeah. when you listen back to it, You'll you'll hear it. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to listen to it again. I've just it been... really bothered me. Now when he was playing solo and it was just the bass, it wasn't as bad because you didn't have that chord playing behind it. Right, right. But he shouldn't have played the G. I don't think. I think the bass player should have played a, you know something else. You know, excuse me. Just just me. You know, I just heard it and it just sounded off to me. But anyway, I did like the song. It's one of my favorites because it's got a really good riff in it you know yeah. i like the riff yeah. just that one part drove me nuts man and it did it like four times and i was like here it comes you know, mm -hmm. so i picked up the bass i said i gotta learn this because i gotta know what i'm <laughs> talking about when i'm <laughs> you know so i you know didn't take the you know, whatever mm -hmm. anyway so then we get to number five blues all around to me best song on the record oh yeah i really love this song got some bb king licks in there you got the Hammond organ in the background, which is played by Kim Simmons. The vocal work was good in this one. I mean, this one was a good song to me. And it was the perfect name of the record, even, too. So mm -hmm. the title track, great song, no complaints, great guitar work. So mm -hmm. The next two, kind of, you know, earlier you were talking about fillers. And I feel like a couple of these were fillers. So we have Texas Love, number six. And then number seven was Winning Hand, and number eight was Hurting Spell. And right. really, a lot of this record, you were talking about the words were kind of elementary. To me, the problem I have with the words is he kept repeating them. You know, every song he would sing the line, and he would sing it again. And he would sing yeah, it again. yeah, and that, that's what I was saying, you know, where I don't think that there was enough time put into the production end of, of, the, of the album yeah. Because of the fact that he passed away. And probably what you were saying earlier, too, is like, you know, they went in there, he just put a vocal in just to keep measure the time, right? You know, I'm going right. to throw this vocal in there, 
we'll come back later and we'll and do the vocals do a clean vocal yeah right and they just didn't have time right so i feel like that's why the words were the way they were you know yeah. because there's well, like three songs on here where you know you could tell he really worked on a lot yeah. Yeah. you know blues all around being one of them and uh <laughs> but some of the other ones they just kind of threw out there you know, well, the I got bass it. and the drums really didn't do anything that made me say, wow, right? I mean, they yeah, the only kinda... thing, the only thing, the only thing that I can say about the, about the, the drums is like, and this involves Texas love. Mm -hmm. It's a good Texas shuffle. You know? Yeah. It was done right. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I get, I get tired of hearing people playing shuffles and calling them well here's a chicago and here's mm -hmm. this and all their shuffles sound the same it's like no yeah. there's differences in the shuffles you know for sure um i mean i'll say the drummer and the bass player were a great rhythm section no doubt yeah, about it. They, they were they were good and yeah. the thing that I, I i've got to say too though about this texas love the guitar sound that was going on reminded me a lot of when back in the 60s when we, us as kids would sit around and and mess around with 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 instruments and stuff acting like we're going to put a band together and somebody show up with a silver tone guitar that came in the case with the amp yeah and that's what the that's, that's what, what the texas like, yeah. love sounded like i i loved that dirty sound it was like yeah it was almost like he took and ripped the speaker that's right it, to get some of that dirty, nasty sound that was happening. You well, know? That's how you got it back then, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They'd take a razor blade, cut your fucking speaker up. That's right. <laughs> that's called distortion. And then the next day, you're going, why did I do that? <laughs> yeah, right. Now yeah. I got to go buy another speaker. My, uh, but you know, yeah. Those JBL D140s, they ain't cheap, man. <laughs> yep. So then we get to number nine, which is Can't Go Back to My Hometown. And this one reminded me a lot of black magic woman. I got Santana. I said, it's a Santana type feel to this. Yeah. You know? I even have the Santana sound written here. His guitar sounded like Santana it had the Latin yep. beat, you mm -hmm. know, which yep. is really, this song was one that stood out as far as the rest, because it was a little different because of the Latin beat. Yeah. Well, it, it was, it was out of the box mm -hmm. as far as what the rest of the songs were, you know? And yeah. And, you know, I got to say, that's what put a Braxis on top when it was released as an album. It was out of the box. Nobody, nobody thought about going that direction. Right. The and then here comes Black Black Magic Woman. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of that, speaking of Black Magic Woman, Greg Raleigh, he's with Journey. Yeah, he played a few after, shows. After 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, it is. And I think what would really be super cool is to see Steve Perry walk on there with him. So I if don't we could, if we could see a Steve Perry, Greg Raleigh, two or three songs, dude, you know, I might even forget about all the crap going on in the band if I could just see that one yeah. more time. Well, you know yourself, Neil Sean's got to take a huge humble pill. Well, and there's Put talks him. about it though, man. They're they're talking about it, and I think Arnell might even be behind it. He might he he might be pushing to get it to to happen because he's he's fed up. He is fed up, but he's also at the point where it's like, dude, you guys are just need to stop. Let's bring a couple of these dudes back, and let's you know do some reunions. But anyway, we can we'll get we'll pay, we'll move on from that because we can talk about <laughs> anyway. Her. Back back to Kim Simmons. Back, yeah, back to Kim Simmons. <laughs> so then we get to number ten. California days gone by. And this one to me reminds me a lot of him reflecting on. Yeah. It was a lot of reflections going on there. Yeah. And again, I and mean, he even brings back, he talks about humble pie, Christine McVie, yeah. the chicken yep. shack, you know, all the stuff that he's been torn around with back in the day. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, and that's what I'm saying. He's just reminiscing. Yeah. And, and this, this whole album to me was the final fanfare for him. He knew it. Yeah. Yep. He knew it. And that's why you've got these songs the Even way they are, you yeah. know, 
even number people. 11, right? My baby yeah. is yeah. kind of like a tribute to his wife, right? Even though some of the stuff probably don't really pertain to his wife, but he, I feel like he put this one because he did the California days reflecting, right? And he's yeah. like, well, I got to throw something to my wife, so I'll do my baby. Right, right. So, yeah. So I agree with what you were saying there, you know, his final fanfare, you know. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was him. I really feel like, I mean, like I say, I really haven't dug really, really deep into the lyrics, but from what I heard mm -hmm. and from what I've read, and from the way the album, the album, the concept of the album was put together, yeah, and how fast it was put together, uh, it really, I really feel like that they raced to put this in the studio and get mm -hmm. it done because they knew, they knew, even Kim Simmons knew it's not too long, and at least he was doing what he loved. And, the, and yeah. you can tell too that I think some of the good, some not good songs, but some of the songs that were more developed probably happened before he found out what, what he had. Right. right. So then right. it was like, oh crap, you know, I don't have much longer. Let's go ahead and throw a bunch of stuff together, see what we can get done. And that's the result yeah. of a few of these songs, you know. I but think I do I feel think, like yeah. that he, in that three month period or two months or however long it was, he was probably like, well, let me go ahead and reflect on some stuff, mm -hmm. throw some stuff for the wife, you know what I mean? And yep. and get those in there before, you know, it's too late. So, yeah. And, and, and that's the whole thing. And again, getting back to the way it was put together, that's why I feel like a lot of the songs, well, not a lot, uh, there, 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 there's a few of the songs on here that you were mentioning earlier they were underdeveloped they yeah. were uh weren't not quite completed finished. yeah they weren't i mean and usually what happens in that situation engineers just faded out you know yeah. <laughs> i mean because yeah, i mean you can come back and you, triple track stuff you just sure faded they out. didn't have time you know yeah i i, I really think they rushed mm -hmm. to put this out i really do and yeah. And songs like Going Down South, I believe that, you know, it's the one with the bloody nose thing. I feel like that was kind of like, this is the state I'm in right now. I don't need many clothes. I'm going down south. It's it's kind of like a, uh, uh, it's not necessarily that he's going down south, but I feel like he's telling you that, you know, I'm going down south. My, my yeah, body's yeah. going away. Right, right. Know? So right. that's kind of what I felt about that song, too. Yeah, it's... You know? I'm, you know, God, we've lost so many people mm -hmm. since 2019. And wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, going on for a while for sure. I mean, Jeff Beck. Yeah. Christine McVie. Yep. Um, well, we got one more song real quick. Number 12, Falling Through the Cracks. It's, you know, the opener was falling through. And then the ends with falling through the cracks. To me, yeah. that was probably my second favorite song on the record because it was just him, acoustic guitar, singing porch porch blues, you know, muddy water yeah. style. Yep. You know, Lightning Hopkins, whoever you want to, you know, sitting call. on the front porch with that that fruit fruit cured moonshine. Yeah. Yes. I mean, <laughs> you know that, that mason jar. <laughs> and, I, and again, I wish the, the there were more on the album like that. I wish they would have had like two or three more like I that did. style because I would have liked the record a lot better had it been that way, you know. Yeah. But I, again, I realized they didn't have time. They were just, you know, rushing to get it done. Yeah. And I'm glad that I'm glad they did put this out. Um, mm -hmm. I have been a huge Savoy Brown fan. Ever since I got back from being overseas, uh, on and and um, I'm not getting into that, that whole story, but yeah, <clears throat> in 1974, when I got out out of the Navy, here I am in Livingston, Montana, 
and I run into these guys. They were from New Jersey. So they had them a house out on the outskirts of town there in Livingston. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they were, you know, three guys. They were, it, it, was, it was like a fraternity house, you know, pretty much. I mean, although it wasn't, they were friends, but that was the way it seemed to be. It was yeah. like a fraternity house. And they had this nice Morant stereo. And I remember going over there and, and, and partying. And one of them threw on Boogie Brothers by Savoy Brown. Yeah, and I'm telling you what, from that day forward, I I was just a huge Savoy Brown fan. Yeah, you know, I was like, oh my god, you know, and it was about that same time too that I heard Free. You know, yeah, uh, it was it, it was like, oh my god, you know, here we come with this hard rock and blues stuff, you know, which was Andy Johns, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, <laughs> but uh. No, we were just talking about producers earlier. And Andy Johns and Max Norman came up. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So well, back to the record again. I keep drifting away. Um, I, again, I was never a big Savoy Brown fan. You know, I mean, it wasn't that I didn't like them. I just never really heard much of them. You know, they're not a radio friendly band. They never, not that they're radio friendly. They just never were mainstream. Well, that's the whole thing. See, and see, I think that that's the difference between. Your your age group, mm -hmm. you know, in my age group, I mean, I remember, I remember uh, when FM Underground was happening, mm -hmm. and they were playing all these bands and playing all these albums. They, they would play the albums front to back. You know? Yeah, DJ sit there, sound like he's hiring a kite going. Okay, we got this deep purple album here, and we're gonna put it on. Yeah. And they put it on side one. And then you hear it, and it go off, oh. and then they put it over and played it, played the other side, you know. And uh, <clears throat> and see, it was during that time period when bands like Savoy Brown were were knocking the doors down you know i mean it, there was no am radio happening and it, deep purple wasn't getting am play yeah savoy brown wasn't black sabbath wasn't led zeppelin wasn't getting am radio play yeah you know it was all fm and fm underground yeah. and uh, <clears throat> that's how i heard about all these fans jethro tall all that yeah. was staying up late at night listening to the fm right and, you know, uh, and all the bands that I listened to coming up always noted Savoy Brown as one of their one of their heroes or you know yeah meant, uh, idols or whatever you want to call it. I mean, they listened mm -hmm. to Savoy Brown. They used to wear the Savoy Brown T shirts, you know. So I mean, I've I'll heard the name. I just never really got into them. I'll and, tell you somebody else you know, that was like that too, and that was Robin Trower. Yeah, yeah. right. Um. Big, I'm big time fan of his, but I, I dare you to show me where he got any airplay. Yeah, the only song on they ever played by radio. him was was Bridge of Size. You know, that's the one that everybody knew is Bridge of Size. But there was so many other great oh my songs. God. You know, which yeah. not I'm not saying Bridge of Size wasn't a great song, but I'm just you know when you say Robin Trower, everybody always says oh Bridge of Size. You know, yeah. But, you know, what about Two Rolling Stones? What about other songs like that? You know, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> there was another there was another album out there too that came out right either before or after Bridge of Size. It was called Twice Removed from Yesterday. Right. Which was like, oh my God, you yeah. know. <laughs> but yeah. that's the whole thing. See, at that time, these people were these guys were big time, but then they never got crossed over into the top 40. Yeah. And, I mean, and I've never ever heard of sad boy brown on the radio ever so mm -hmm. um and it's a shame because that older stuff man you know tell mama stuff like that i mean that's yeah. some good rocking stuff man you know oh yeah well it's so, that's my guitar work on tell mama yeah yep, i know that's what i'm saying you know because when i read this he was talking about how he was playing slide because his fingers weren't working but then when i went back the first song i saw was tell mama and he's playing slide all over it and right, I'm like, right. okay, well, he's a slide player, you know? Right, right, yeah. Because, I mean, you know, you have to be able to do that. You can't just grab a slide and not know how to play a slide, you know? 
So, but anyway, all right, well, we'll wrap it up real quick. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, a solemn thought on this record because you know it's the last one. Um, you know, I mean, it wasn't, it, I, I don't want to trash the record and it's not a trash record by any means. It's just, I just didn't, it just didn't hit me, you know? I mean, yeah. I like some of the songs on there, but it wasn't, it's not something that just hit me. You know what I mean? I, I mean, d- some I, records I, I, just hit you. Yeah. Well, I just you think know. that this album right here is going to, and probably already has, uh, hit the hardcore fans. Mm-hmm. And I think that that was the target. Yeah. Once they put it, put the whole package together. And uh, I mean, and that's people like me, you know, I mean, right. I, with all, all the flaws or whatever you want to mm-hmm. call it, what I hear is. It's the end of an era, man. Yes. Yeah, the end of an era. The man went down doing what he loved. Yep. There's no doubt about it. And I mean, I'm not, uh, like I said, I'm not trashing you know, the record by. Right. Anything. Right. No, I know. I know what yeah. you're saying. I know what yeah. you're saying. It, it's one of those things you had to be there type yep. situation you know and, and if and, i was a fan of his i mean i probably would appreciate this more not that i don't appreciate it it's just that you know a lot of the songs are all basically eight bar blues you know yep, um, yep. but tremendous guitar playing man the solos are fantastic i wish that they would have had more time to finish some of these songs and i, I probably would have ranked it a little higher but you know well, I really the love the acoustic song, The Fall Into the Cracks. I think that was fantastic. Right. You know, there was three other songs that I liked, but then I, I had like I, six that were like, mm, you know. When I heard the when I heard the opening cut on this album, I mean that was as far as I went at that time. <clears throat> and I honestly thought it was going to be an acoustic album all the way through. I was like, wow, this is really one. 180 out from the way Savoy Brown did things because yeah. I mean he um well I mean even on on Boogie Brothers it shows three Stratocasters across the front mm-hmm. <laughs> you know that that's the front album covers three Strats yeah and it's got Boogie Brothers written right above it and then just to hear the acoustic stuff I can't really think of. And of course, I'm not not going to say I know all their albums inside out. There are a lot of their albums I haven't heard. I mean, there's thirty some yeah, records, thirty thirty some some <laughs> albums out there. But my point is, is, this was the first time I had heard anything about Savoy Brown doing anything acoustic at all, yeah. and yeah, I, I mean, heard it. I, and I was I was like, yeah, that's it. You know, I, you got I mean, the Mason on Charles with moonshine, and he's rocking, right? And he's singing, and he's playing slide guitar on old broke down acoustic guitar. You know, yeah, you know. I mean, yeah. there you go. Probably only five strings on it. Yeah. You know? Well, even on this record, I mean, he's got two different flying bees and a Les Paul. So, I mean, you know, you know what you're getting just by looking at the cover. You're going to have a Gibson plugged into probably a Marshall, mm-hmm. and that's the sound that's coming out. You know, so yeah. But anyway, all right. Well, I, I gave it a 6.2. Um, I wish I could have gave it more. I mean, I, I feel like it's a sentimental record, especially it is. for Sad Boy it Brown is. fans. And I appreciate what he did on here. And the guitar playing was great. You know, you had Garnett Grimm on drums and Pat DeSalvo on bass. They've been with right. him for a long time. Yep. Um, they were solid, but there wasn't nothing that really jumped out at me. Um, but I mean, for Savoy Brown fan, you got to have this man. Cause yep. you know, it kind of closes up the chapter, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, like, like I say, I'm going to, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'm going to give it a good, I'm going to give it a nine. Yeah. And I'm going to hand, uh, Pat DeSalvo and Garnet Grimm a lot of credit. Yeah. For following, following through with, putting this album together it had to be hard for sure it had to be a hard thing to sit in that studio and finish up things without kim simmons there yeah and and i mean a lot of it is like you know you got to figure out what he's doing and then put something to it you know and the thing is too 
Right. The thing is, too, is, and I'm sure they downplayed a lot of what they were feeling because they didn't, they didn't want to overshadow, they didn't want to overshadow Kim, Kim Simmons. And, uh, you know what? My hat's off. Kudos to you. Um, we lost a big one here. Mm -hmm. Um, Right along with a bunch of and, other ones. That you know, matter of fact, you didn't even know he was gone when we were getting this record. No, I didn't. I remember you were saying, "Hey, Savoy Brown's got a new one." Then we looked that right. up. I ordered the ordered it. You know, and then I was like, "You know, he passed away." And you're like, yep. "What? Yep, yep, <laughs> yeah, so. yep." And that's when I started really digging into it. Right. Uh, All right. Well, we'll wrap this up real quick. Um, Savoy Brown, Blues All Around, not a bad record. I mean, I gave it a 6-2. Mike's giving it a 9. I mean, he's a he's been with Savoy Brown since early days. I'm yeah. just now coming into him, you know. Um, it's it's a decent record. You got to have it if you're a Savoy Brown fan. I mean, it's the end of an era, really. Um, it's just a reminder that you need to get out there and go see these people that are yep. still around doing it because you don't know how much longer they're going to be around, man. I mean, I never got to see Jeff Beck live. I wish I could have. And now I can't. Uh, I got, I have to, I have to look at it. Like, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be around. <laughs> well, I mean, true for me too, as well. I mean, I or all of us, right. But, before I, I kicked the bucket. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. So. You know, truth right. be told, but yeah, there you go. You know, uh, well, with that being said, everybody get out there and live. Exactly. Go live mm -hmm. it up. You know, go yeah. see a concert. I just saw the Winery Dogs. Great show. Yeah. Do Rival go Sons out. is coming. I, I, I would love to see people get out and start supporting the live entertainment again. Yep. Uh, it's and coming I'm talking, around. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about bands. I'm not yeah, talking about bands. acoustic. Yeah. I'm not talking about these duo acts and these acoustic acts. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about go out and support your local bands yeah um, <clears throat> it's, we should do it we should do an infomercial on it man yeah well i mean it's it's is turning into a dying art actually it is i know i mean that's a shame um, and next week we'll even prove that more <laughs> yeah. oh yeah yeah. Yes. Yeah, stay tuned next week stay tuned. next week's gonna be fun we're gonna have a couple special guests next week too yes we are so so, because yeah. me and Mike need the help on this one. <laughs> You'll see. Yeah. All right. Well, until we're next time. <laughs> What's that? So we're not going to spoil it. <laughs> no, we're not going to spoil it. No. But you'll know next time when you when you tune in next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Till next time, y'all stay safe. That's right. Peace out. Listen to the music.